Okay, good evening everybody at home and also to a small audience that we have here today, this evening, so thank you for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce James Gribble this evening. So James is the founder of Empower Golf. He's also an art client um, here with us um, following a spinal cord injury that he sustained in 2008. So this evening, James will be sharing his story and his journey following his spinal cord injury, um, the huge amounts of hard work that he has put into his own rehab and the sort of three key points that he'll be discussing this evening is um, why recreation is as important as rehabilitation, why it's a great time to be a quadriplegic, and most importantly, how we all need perspective sometimes. So over to you, James, and thank you. Can I get claps on anything here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to get this back to the first. I'll get back to my first slide here. Yeah. Yeah. We good? It's kind of funny, a bit of a funny angle. This. No, that camera. one, the camera, I think. So I just need to be able to touch here. That working? Yeah, that's a bit better, I think. So. I think so, yeah. Well, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> We've got some technical issue here. <laughs> woman down, woman down. <laughs> We're having a 10 second laughter pause. You good? <laughs> All right. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, probably an apologies for the first photo up there. I couldn't really resist, given the 12 months we've, we've had, just to put some sort of reference into COVID. Um, but um, I think every time I start off one of these presentations, I, I kind of I feel it's almost kind of surreal. I think when, you, when you're when you a 10-year-old boy and you, you think about what you're going to be doing as a 42-year-old, you never really picture yourself staying, sitting in front of a a room full of people uh, in a wheelchair. So I always find it quite surreal when I start talking a bit about my journey and and uh, how I've got here. But um, tonight I'm going to try and provide a little bit of insight into my emotional and psychological and physical journey to date. I'm going to try and give you a bit of a feel about how losing some of my passions has enabled me to empower others. And finally, just give you some perspectives on rehabilitation and recreation and how in my mind, they're absolutely intrinsically linked. So I'm going to try and firstly sort of summarize my journey by in, in 10 kind of short days. We're going to start with the three days before my accident. Then we're going to fast forward to the three days directly after my accident. Amazing, I got I literally got a shot of where I where I fell and where I broke my neck. Getting to hospital in a pretty bad way, and then the day after, I'm first sitting up. Finally, the four days since then to today. Bit of golf, as you all probably expect. Managed to get in a cheeky bungee jump in New Zealand last year or two years ago. Had a crack at gliding. And then obviously trying to get back into my, my walking and, and ambulation. So I thought we'd I'd just start with a little bit of background about myself. I'm a, I'm a Sydney, Sydney guy. I was brought up mostly around here, actually. Um, Apart from that, I found myself in Malaysia. My parents were living over there, so I had a couple of years in Malaysia. And like everyone, after finishing university here, I, um, like a lot of Australians, I ended up getting packing my bags and going out on a, on a mission. First stop was Europe to do a bit of um, bit of travelling. And after a couple of months, I found myself back in London with um, with no money and started to look for a job. Believe it or not, it was the, it was the 11th of September 2001. Just, just before the, the, the towers went down, I got two very um, very different phone calls about five minutes apart. One was for a job as an assistant pro at a golf club, at a golf club in London. 
and the second was to get to take a, a graduate banking job. And given the, uh, well, was that actually the Bank of Scotland, one of the banks over there? Given the Aussie dollar was three to one to the pound at that point, I, um, and it was winter, and chances of playing golf in the winter in, in the UK, I took the banking job, and and really the the rest is history in that respect in my career. Now, fast forward to two thousand and eight, I um I got made redundant um, in the GFC, like many people over there, and at that point, my biggest passions were the ocean, adventure travel, people and golf. And really being, making, being made, um, made redundant was like the first catalyst for me to put, start put, instead of putting aside some of the, my adventure travel plans, really brought it straight to the front and I managed to, to book a flight to Africa and, and set out on this amazing journey. My, my plan was pretty much to start in Cape Town in the south and pretty much make my way all the way up to Cairo looking at some work opportunities um, along the way. I was probably are the happiest, the freest, and the most kind of carefree and independent that I'd, I'd really, um, really ever been. And um, unfortunately, unfortunately for me, after about four weeks, I uh, managed to damage my, um, damage my, or break my neck and, and damage my spinal cord. Now, the day before I broke my neck, as you saw, I was literally gorge swinging across Victoria Falls and whitewater rafting on the Zambezi River. But later that night, I got got back to the part of Zambia where I'd gone specifically to try and catch a thing called the tiger fish, which you can see that scary looking fish on the top right. You can imagine like a piranha and a tuna have kind of had a love child. <laughs> That's pretty much it. It's one of the scariest, most prized fish in, uh, in Southern Africa. Now, the morning of my accident, I, I woke up and I'd met a young, another young traveler who literally just got back from a place called Beauville Island, which is on the Zambezi river. And he's, just caught his first ever tiger fish. And he was so excited, he wanted to sort of take me back there and, and show me himself. So we arranged some transport for that day. And because I loved my running at that point, and I hadn't been, I've been traveling so much, so hard up until that, that point, I um, thought I'd better, better use my ASICS Keanos that I've been dragging along for a month. And I went out for a long run in, um, in 40 degree heat. Anyway, later on, I, um, I found myself on this you know, four wheel drive going bush backing, bush bashing across Southern Zambia. And just on nightfall, we got to the edge of the, the river and we literally got offloaded and put in dugout canoes and literally paddled across into this like tiny little island on the Zambezi river. As we made ourselves up onto the, up into the, where the camp was, there's literally no power. There was all thatch roof, fishing, fishing cabins. And all I remember was going into the main cabin, um, sitting down on the stool. And just as I sat down, I just remember feeling just a little bit lightheaded. And before I knew it, I'd, uh, I'd fainted and apparently fallen back off the stool I was sitting on, landed on my head and, um, and broke my neck. So at that point, I pretty much lost everything. I, um, I lost my passions. Um, I used to be a very good swimmer. Even breathing at that point was difficult. I went from a single figure handy golf, hand, handed golfer to not even able to hold the club. And I went from being on this absolute you know, amazing journey of a lifetime to literally lying there with no movement from my head down. Now, because it was, because it was already dark, I had to actually lie there and wait for, for the entire light entire night until a helicopter would come in the first night first thing the next morning and as i lay there um sort of contemplating what my life would look like obviously petrified i simply just focused on trying not to pass out because i didn't know if i passed out whether i'd um whether I'd ever ever wake up again now where do you start when your life changes an instant like that where do you start when your whole world just gets flipped on the end and when do you start when a massive catas catastrophic challenge like that lands right on your, on, your, on your doorstep? The answer is it has to start with attitude. My attitude was very simple. I, I will recover and I will get my passions back. From then on, I focused on basically the physical and emotional rehabilitation and my 
I used to call it rebuilding the masterpiece. And the biggest thing was getting back to my passions. Now, I certainly, certainly sat there on the first night sort of contemplating, you know, why, why this happened to me and what if, you know, I hadn't been made redundant that, that day, that, that year. And why such a simple accident in the absolute prime of my life? The next morning, I realized that having these thoughts was absolutely frivolous and that I should focus all my energy on getting better. I realized that even in such a catastrophic situation, we all have the power of choice. So whether you're disabled or the best athlete in the world, whether you're rich or, or begging for every meal or highly intelligent or struggling to read and write, we all have the power to choose. So I started my journey back to, to back to my passions, but at that point, obviously I couldn't hold a golf club. Being in the water was obviously a scary thought. And the idea of getting on a, on a plane was just as scary. So I had to start with visualization. The only thing I could physically do at that point was visualize. So I'd take myself back to the ocean, the feeling of running down the beach, diving in the water. In, in my golf, I would literally lie there at night playing rounds and rounds of golf, shot by shot. Um, obviously always playing a little bit better than I did when I was, when I was able body. <laughs> and I'd imagine, you know, going back on these amazing adventures, you know, things like seeing the glaciers in Greenland, swimming my wrestling in Japan, and even skiing in New Zealand. Now, one of the first kind of mem sort of memorable people I met along this journey was a psychologist when I got to to rehabilitate like to the rehab center. And even though I was in my, in my mind going quite well psychologically, I sort of sat down with her and explained what I was doing with my visual, visualization. And she, she basically mapped out that even though it was a great thing to do, the way I could make it even better was give more texture to some of my visualization. So to give you an example, when I was thinking about swimming, instead of just the idea of running down the beach, think about what the, the feeling of the water as it came over your head or the taste of the salt in your mouth or even that annoying sting in your eyes when you when you come up for it and that's what i did that's what i ended up having to do with my golf as well so instead of thinking about the actual shot think about the birds or the sounds of the birds the, the smell of the cut grass or even what your feet felt like to be to be on the ground and similarly when i thought about travel Think about the accents of the people where you where you turned up, or the smells or the sounds as you got off the, the got off the um off the plane, or even just the excitement, you know, that emotional attachment to travel. It was really from this point that I could start focusing on some of my on my bigger bigger goals of recovery. Now I loved adventure, but for me, you know, my Everest got literally landed on my um, on my lap. And like other people who've suffered you know, massive catastrophic injuries, you don't really make that choice. But when it's when it lands on your lap, then you've got no hard choice just to just to deal with it and move on. And this is certainly how I saw my rehabilitation journey. Now, the first thing I realised with spinal cord injury that I, I certainly wasn't going from lying paralysed on the sand in Zambia to up and up and playing golf. You know, the next day I realised that. It was going to take a lot of hard work over a long period of time. And with, oh, sorry. Yeah, long, long, long period of time and focusing on tiny, tiny little goals. So as you all know, there's no actual cure for spinal cord injury. And at that point, we were forced into a lot of, well, not forced, but the only real therapy was all your Western therapies, so physiotherapists, occupational therapists, um, you know, aqua, aqua therapy, et cetera, et cetera. So really I wanted to try pretty much everything that was out there. I tried electro, electric stimulation. I tried Chinese medicine, acupuncture. I think at my, at my, my sort of most desperate, I ended up taking singing lessons because I thought it would help me with my, um, with my core strength and my breathing. <laughs> now, lucky for me, my body did react a little bit. And, um, after four long, hard years, I'll be working sort of 50, 60 hours a week. I did manage to get to the point where I could um, walk a little bit on crutches. And for the ARC people in this room, you probably recognize I'm Adrian 
BIAC on the on the screen there. Um, now, one of the things I really recognised early that for me, part of my rehabilitation was always going to be focused on recreation and returning to my passions. My sort of mantra was, why do all of the the basic, you know, day to day get be able to do all the day to day things if you can't return to the things you love and I certainly loved a lot of things in life. And this really led me to mapping out some of my goals and my rehab, not just the functional stuff day to day, but also, you know, events and, and other sports. So my passions. Now, I've got a long list of passions, but um, these are the ones that I really focused on because at the time they were definitely my strongest. Um, and I thought I'd give you just go through these and give you a bit of background as to to why I love them, how I form these goals, and what was the process to get there. Now, I think with the ocean, my mum still swears that when I was a little kid, I could actually swim before I could walk. Um, when I think about it, I think the freedom of the ocean that there's probably a lot of people in this room also share is just something that's pretty intangible. That that feeling when you first dive in and all of your like, problems and worries just go away. There must be some sort of kind of chemical reaction with the salt water or the cold. Um, and that's something that's always been, you know, but always go back and you have the same result. Now, as you know, with spinal cord injury, a lot of people have temperature control issues. And, and I certainly found that very early on. So I knew my journey back to, to the ocean was going to be a bit of a long-winded one. Um, one of my actually earliest earliest memories was with um, Melissa McConaughey at the old um, Hark Rehab Center with the overground pool, and I remember you know discussing whether we could set the, the temperature between twenty four and twenty eight degrees just so I could get in. Um, I did look for the photo of Mel in her um, in her swimming costume, but, um, <laughs> but unfortunately, unfortunately, I couldn't find it. Um, but if you'd seen the photo, I'm literally there. I've got neck floats, I've got hip floats, I've got feet floats. Um, but that's where we kind of kind of started, right? Um, but my goal was always to return, not just to the ocean, but to ocean swimming, which I used to do. And I, um, after breaking my neck in 2008, it took me about five years um, to compete in my first um, ocean swim, which is about 1.5k. Um, all I was wearing was back to just the goggles and a, a couple of hand paddles, um, which gave me a bit more pull through the water. And I won't, I won't throw it out there to the crowd to guess, but it took me about an hour and a half to do 1.5k. So it was definitely, definitely a long way. <laughs> now, fast forward to this year, I've done the same ocean swim every year and I did, did it in just under 50 minutes this year. So we all talk about, you know, long-term rehab and, and getting results and that's a great example. It took me 12, 12 years to get down to 50 minutes for 1.5k swimming. Now, the second is travel. Now, when I, because I was brought up partly in Malaysia, I think I got this early exposure to travel and, all, and I've, I think I pretty much loved it ever since. And I think in Australia, we're very spoiled um, because a lot of people seem to do a lot of travel. But um, I think the key things for me is that travel gets you out of that, that comfort zone. And you get to learn so much about cultures, about history, about language. And again, one of my passions, people. Um, so before the wheelchair came along, my, my goal of travel was always to get to about 100 countries in my life. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to say that I'm sort of well past the sort of 70 mark and my, my, my wheelchair hasn't actually stopped me that much. Probably... Um, one of my favourite locations, if you see that on the on the right on the screen, was um, I had a couple of mad friends who, who dragged me up to a UNESCO heritage site at the top of um, one of the glaciers in, in Greenland a couple of years ago. So um, I was pretty lucky in that respect. Um, but probably my biggest goal to date, travel-wise, was always to go back to, to Zambia and go back to where I, where I had my accident. Um, but I'll come back to that a little bit later. Now, look, people are the reason I'm here today. I, um, in the simplest of forms, when I broke my neck, if there wasn't anyone around, I wouldn't have even got off that, that island. And um, I think for all of us in, in personal life or in business, we realise that actually if you don't have a good team around you, great people, then 
you pretty much can't achieve anything. And I think for me, if I look back at what's the fundamental, um, the keys to why my journey has been okay is because of great people around me. So whether that was family, girlfriend, friends, and, and even stranger, even strangers. So I think through that, through that process and, and through going or spending time in a wheelchair and being around a lot of people with disabilities, I realized that actually one of the things, one of the goals in my life is to give back to that community and give back to a lot of the people in other ways because of all the things that helped me with. Now, finally, golf. Now, a lot of you are probably sitting there thinking it's the most boring sport. <laughs> um, and I certainly was exactly the same. I've got to be honest, when I was a teenager, my best friend lived on a golf course in Sydney and I used to go over there and he'd go out and play golf and I'd you know, go to the pool or, or hang out. So it wasn't really until my second year at university when one of my godfathers came over from the UK and he said, oh, you know, why don't we go and have a hit of golf? And I thought, well, let's not waste our time. Let's just go and have a beer and do it the old fashioned way. But he convinced me, he pestered me and that day I ended up going and play golf and actually for someone who didn't really like it or wasn't never really played, I actually played it right. And I think yeah, just a, just a combination of those two things and I was I was absolutely hooked. Now the reason I love golf and I've and from that point is that I really feel like it's a, a kind of metaphor for life, the game. You know, it's this roller coaster of emotions. You, you know, you hit this amazing shot and then suddenly, you know, you miss hit or you, you do an air swing and it's I think for me, it, map, it does map life in a lot of ways. The other thing I love is that every time you go on a, on a different golf course, you play on be in beautiful locations, you play different holes, apart, compared to a lot of other sports where you're playing this, you know, on a tennis court or the same location. Now, it wasn't until probably about two years after I broke my neck that I first Googled quadriplegic golfer. And um, as you can imagine, there wasn't many... Um, there wasn't many, many results. Um, now it wasn't until later that year, I'd gone back to the UK to visit some friends. And one of my, one of my buddies told me that there was a disabled golf tournament on and he thought it'd be worthwhile if we, we went out a look. So I turned up and I was obviously just as keen as my friends to see how people with disabilities play golf. So I found myself sort of making my way over to the first tee and went up to the group that was standing there and obviously asked what I thought was a pretty, pretty innocent question. So, Hey guys, what, what are all your handicaps? And of course I got <laughs> some pretty random answers. One guy told me he just had a stroke. One person had MS and the guy with the, with the cane, like tapping it on the floor, obviously reminded me that he was a blind golfer. So that day I learned and I saw the amazing ability of people with disabilities playing golf. And um, it wasn't until later that year um, when I started to learn how to walk on crutches and felt stable in that upright position that I actually grabbed a friend of mine. And if you look at that, that photo on the, on the left there, grabbed a friend of mine and asked him if we could go to the local park and actually stand me up in my wheelchair. And once I stood up with, with two arms, take off, one of my um, one of my crutches and then strap a club to my head, <laughs> um, which obviously for a lot of the OHS people in this room would be an absolute nightmare, and it was. Um, but the fact that I could actually swing the golf club and connect, like it was just you know it was just that first little taste, and um, you know I never really have been an emotional person, but being able to stand up for the first time and swinging a golf club after so many you know, years and, and nights thinking about whether I could ever do that. It was, um, it was a pretty emotional moment for me. Um, and then really from there, I looked around, given that it was still quite, quite unsafe in the setup that I was running, I looked around for other bits of equipment out there that could not only potentially support me in that upright position, but also maneuver me around the golf course. So I actually play 18 holes just like anyone else. And it wasn't long after that, I, saw, I found the Paragolfer, which if you look in that middle picture is, it's basically a stand up all terrain um, a power chair, which is built specifically for golf. So whether you want to go in and out of the bunkers, whether you want to drive onto the greens without damaging the surface, pretty much anything you can, you can do on a golf course is replicated by the Paragolfer. Oops, sorry. 
Now, I can't go any further without introducing Empower Golf. Um, Empower Golf is basically a combination of my three biggest passions, golf, travel, and people. And really, through my personal journey back to golf, I looked at the landscape of Australia um, in the golfing industry. And the unfortunate thing, even though it's one of the biggest, or it is the biggest ball sport in Australia, and it's got more infrastructure than per capita than pretty much anywhere else in the world, the reality was if I went to a golf club, there was still access issues, there was lack of equipment. And if you went to your local golf pro to ask him for a golf lesson, you know, he'd never met or given a lesson to anyone with a, with a disability. So really in setting up Empower Golf, it was to fix most of those. And my dream was, and still is that within reason, so 90% of, of the population in Australia will be able to get to be within sort of an hour, an hour and a half of a golf club where you not only have access, but you'd have um, equipment like the Paragolfer and other you know, adaptive devices. And if you wanted to go there and have a golf lesson, then you have someone who'd been trained and would understand exactly what your disability was all about, about whether you're an amputee, whether you're blind or wheelchair based like me. Um, so fast forward seven years, um, we've done a lot of things, but probably some of the things I'm most proud of, we put about 15,000 Australians with disabilities through our golf clinics. We've built 15 Empower Golf hubs, which is, as I said, an inclusive facility, which has been signed off to have the access equipment and education. We've put thousands, put people through thousands and thousands of private lessons and course support. And we've funded and become be, supported clubs to fund lots of equipment. So as it stands now, there's about 50 para golfers floating around Australia from a standing start. And most importantly, one of the things that we are even more proud about is that we've worked with Golf Australia and the PGA of Australia to build out a module so that any PGA professional who's gone through and become a teaching professional can also do what they call now an all abilities accreditation, which is specifically for people with, um, with disabilities. Over and above that, we've, um, because my dream was always to compete and probably slightly selfishly, we, um, we've created a network of, of competitions around Australia. So now every year, in each state, there's an inclusive tournament where people just like myself who have handicaps can actually go and compete and, and compete for world ranking points to then go and travel around the world and play in tournaments. So I was very lucky to in uh, just before everything shut down with COVID a couple of years ago to travel to, to Spain and compete in the inaugural world wheelchair golf, um, golf tournament. And for people who are in the, in the business, most people think that in the Paralympics in 2028, there'll be some sort of, para, of um, disabled golf, which will obviously be, again, biasly a massive thing, so I could go and have a, have a crack. Um, now, probably sitting there thinking, well, you, you pretty much designed in power golf so you could find an excuse to travel and play golf, or that's pretty much, pretty much what it is. Um, but now if you Google quadriplegic golfer seven years on, I'll tell you there's a, there's a much better, much bigger, much bigger difference. And just for the people who are, who are either want to be involved themselves or the therapists out there or anyone else who, who wants to find out more, you can go to our website. Um, as I said, we run, we run clinics, we do lessons, we have course support, competition, equipment, um, pretty much anything to do with disabled golf. You can, you can come contact us there. Just to give you a bit of a visual um, representation of what we do, again, you'll laugh, but this was a, um, a clinic we did up in Darwin a couple of years ago, which I obviously had to, um, to be there as well. Um, and hopefully, if I press play here, we'll get the, get the audio as well. It's one of the most popular sports, but have you ever thought how hard it might be to play golf when you're missing a limb? Empower Golf is an organisation that helps people with disabilities access the game and as Henry Jones reports, it's looking for a home in Darwin. Golf's reputation precedes itself. Golf's probably one of the most frustrating games you can play, but imagine having no movement from your chest down and only playing with one arm. And that's exactly how hundreds of Aussies now tee off. 
Thanks to James Gribble, who after suffering a spinal injury soon realised one of his passions wasn't accessible. I looked at the industry and it was actually quite underloved as a disabled sport and really wanted to change that. James set up Empower Golf, an organisation that aims to make the game accessible to everyone. Through his work with a small team out of Sydney, he's changed the golfing landscape in Australia, including fundraising for equipment like the Paragolfer, which didn't previously exist anywhere in the country. Now for someone who can't A, stand up or B, swing a golf club, you know, this is a, a life-changing thing for them to be able to do. Empower Golf doesn't just assist amputees like Bali bombing survivor Ben Talapan, but also those suffering mental disabilities and returned servicemen and women. I think a lot of us are injured where I'm at work, so I think golf's a great game to be able to cater for injuries and whatnot. We find it an absolutely really powerful for those guys, whether it's just getting back out in the community or you know the great outdoors. Empower Golf is on the hunt for a home in the Territory. Darwin Golf Club had its trial today. Try and work out which is the best club for us to set up what we call an Empower Golf Hub, which is effectively an inclusive facility that will do some fundraising to get the equipment and run a schedule of clinics. Palmerston Golf Course will host a clinic tomorrow to put forward its eligibility. Henry Jones, ABC News. Now, it's always been my dream once we sort of got the, started making progress in the golf industry to look at how we could go into other sports um, or recreation, even therapy. Um, you know, I picture a day when we can have, you know, someone in Adelaide give me a call and we can take them fishing or, you know, skiing down the, down the snowy mountains or any type of recreation um, and travel as a combination for me is just, you know, what, what makes the world go around. So um, that's sort of the next steps in terms of what we're going to do, whether we call it Empower Life or, you know, something similar, but um, definitely something that we're in the process of, of researching. Now, people obviously think I'm joking when I, when I put this slide up, but, um, you know, it's, it's pretty serious. I think that, you know, when you go back 20, 30 years and look at the, the landscape as a, as a heavy disabled person, whether it's a quadriplegic or anyone else, like the, the landscape is very, very different. Um, obviously, the key the key parts are from the screen there. In terms of technology, um, there's amazing, you know, examples of this. But whether you're looking at you know the dictating software, um, you know, touch screen technology, um, even simple things, you know, the fact that you can you know sit on your couch these days and order you know pretty much any cuisine from around the world. You know, give the guy, you know, a touch, touch code to come into your building and, you know, pay for it wirelessly. Like that's, you know, a good way to get fat probably. But um, yeah, this is one example of, you know, the technology. Um, in terms of equipment, I mean, you guys see just as much as anyone else, like the equipment, how it's changed. Um, so whether it's traveling, you know, getting on and off planes, um, whether it's personal mobility equipment, um, I don't know if you've seen the segways that have, uh, have been going around or even things in, in recreation. So whether it's, you know, golf, whether it's you know, surfing, um, pretty much these days, if, if you've thought of it, and then um, when someone, someone's had a crack. And I suppose probably most importantly in medicine, we've seen how modern medicine can just adapt so quickly over the last 12 months with something like COVID. Um, seeing how medicine can not only um, you know, change the world for people with things like the spinal cord injury um, coming up. Um, I know from a great example is obviously life expectancy. I mean, when I had my accident even 12 years ago, the life expectancy of a quadriplegic was, was nowhere near as much as it is now. It's pretty much full, full life expectancy or normal um, life expectancy. Um, I, I think the latest technology I've heard of in the in the world of, of spinal cord injury is a, is, a, is a drug that they're trialing in Germany at the moment where they they basically severed the back of a mouse um, and through just literally taking like an ingestible tablet, it starts to re-prepare the, the central nervous system. Um, but that's just one example of many you know, amazing things that have been worked on around the world. And I guess the other thing for people with spinal cord injuries and is whether, you know, if you, if you do want to have children, um, 
that's one of the technologies that has become much more prevalent. Well, not just if you're if you're a quadriplegic, but for people people in general. So I like to argue, you know, up, you know, it's only going to get better. Um, I like to think and hope that, you know, for most people with spinal cord injuries that are my age or a bit, a bit younger, that it'll be cured in some form um, by the end of our life. Now, even though there are all these amazing technologies, um, one of the sort of lessons I've sort of had to live through is is looking to adapt in in, in life. Um, I think it's a pretty sort of prominent feature of everyone's life, really, whether it's in your personal life or in business. If you're not adapting, then you know you're either falling behind or you're not making the most of your opportunities. And um, and certainly for me, that was a that was a pretty early, pretty firm lesson to learn quite early on. Um, one of the things I find quite interesting about my condition is and is around the, the sort of giving and taking of help or having to be become accustomed with losing your independence because like when you really step back and think about it, pretty much everybody relies on someone else every day of the week. So whether you break your car or you know, just simple things like that. Everyone in our communities are into relying on people. And I think one of the things I say, particularly for people with spinal cord injuries that um, that lose a lot of their independence is that try and focus on that fact because you know yes you've lost some of the independence you had but everybody out there in one way or another whether you get sick whether your car breaks you know relies on anyone else um, and I think you know adaptability like there's a couple of my favorite photos just from, from traveling up there um, the one top left is when um, when I called and got photos of my wheelchair accessible room um, when I was traveling in uh, in Scandinavia and I remember pushed up and down the stairs every time I left our cottage. Um, obviously just getting dragged backwards up into a plane that was I was in Greenland again on a tiny little aircraft um, and probably my favorite um, where I'm a mad fisherman as you'll, you'll find out and um, we had a slight solution, a slight problem of how to actually get in the boat. So we went down to the local service station on the south coast and um, and grabbed the forklift truck to um, to pop me in there. Again, great example of our HMS going out the window. <laughs> um, the other thing I mentioned earlier was 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 choice. So one of the things that I've really learned to understand about humans and a lot of what we drive, a lot of what drives us day to day is is having the ability to choose now. In some people that you might choose to work hard so that it gives you the options of you know where you live or where you go on holiday some people choose to do exercise because they you know want to feel good or they want to be able to do the things they love but one of the things that you lose when you break your neck is a lot of that a lot of that choice um you lose the choice to be able to you know get out of bed by yourself you lose the choice you know in some cases to breathe by yourself um i think on that recovery journey, that's what you're fighting, fighting to get back all of those choices or as many of those choices you can. Um, now in my case, I can honestly say that the first four years post spinal cord injury, I literally never worked harder or more obsessively on absolutely anything. Um, but even with all that work, which I thought was literally just gonna, it would be a matter of time. If you put the work in, you know, you, you get better and you recover fully. Um, even though I have recovered substantially, that, that simply wasn't the case. Um, so the reality for me is that still in the morning, you know, what would normally take most people 20 minutes to jump up, have a shower, get some breakfast and run out, out of the room, that's still, that's about a two hour, two hour journey for me every morning. Um, you know, if someone doesn't turn up and help me out of bed, then you know, I'd be lying there all day. Um, the other thing about um, a lot of people with disabilities that, that they don't have the choice of sharing their disability. It's very visual. So as soon as someone sees you, um, you know, they're already making all these assumptions. Um, but probably one of the most powerful things I've realized is that even though our, our journey or our story is, is physical, is that everybody has a story, whether it's, you know, a sick child at home or someone suffering from depression or any multitude of things. So, that's been quite a powerful thing for me to learn. And actually, because your disability is always there to be digested, 
you find that you build these much stronger human connections because people share what's what's the equivalent to a spinal cord injury in their life, um, which is meant meant to really really deep have a very early personal connections with people. Now, two questions that I get asked a lot is like, what is the first one is what is the hardest thing about being a quadriplegic? And um, for me, it's always the same answer. The hardest thing for me is not being able to be that physical presence in people's lives, especially your loved ones. So whether it's whether it's your partner or your god your godchildren or even just being able to throw your arms around your your mum and dad. Um, just that lack of ability and that, that physical presence, that's probably something that I that I find the hardest. Um, and the second question I get asked a lot is, has having a spinal cord injury made you a better person? Now, <laughs> the second one's not as easy, not as easy to answer, but um, definitely what it has made me become is, is a lot more humble. Um, it's definitely taught me patience and I think like, First and foremost, um, resilience. You know, I think we're all um, we've all got a sort of baseline of resilience that we have, and it's not until we really get pushed you know, to find out what that really is. Now, the um, the biggest challenge with the ongoing re re rehabilitation, and, and is for me anyway, is finding that balance. As we mentioned earlier, like I've always focused a lot more on the recreation side. Um, but maintaining the balance between the two, trying to fit everything in in life. You know, we've all got seemingly busier and busier lives. So getting that work, life, recreation, rehab um, is very, very difficult. Uh, I think for me, the way I try to do that is um, what I've done in the past is constantly looking to find new, new equipment and new goals. Um, so obviously a lot of you in this room will know of the Lexo, which, which is at ARC at the moment, which has been a great piece of new equipment for me to test myself in, in different ways, whether it's through stamina, um, whether it's through focusing on particular parts of my walking, um, whether, and all in a very, in a sort of safe, you know, hoisted environment. Um, probably the, the thing that I try and map out most with my sort of ongoing rehabilitation is, is events. So training for events or whether it's an ocean swim, a golf tournament or something, you know, even, even more crazy, you know, the thing I've been sort of contemplating that most recently is where I can do some sort of adaptive like triathlon where I can, you know, walk a certain amount, amount. obviously I can do the swimming and then look at the cycling. Um, and the other thing is the balance between pure maintenance or keeping you to where you are now and then obviously that chasing, chasing absolute recovery. Now, finally, I can't finish this tonight's presentation without talking about um, the tiger fish and my, my potent, potential to return to try and catch it. Um, look, it was always a plan when I broke my neck and I, and I didn't catch the tiger fish that I would get back to, to Zambia one day. Um, but for me, in my mind, it was probably the biggest challenge I've come to today. And the, really, the reason for that is it really a culmination of not just the physical side of my of my recovery, but also the emotional and the um, you know the the psychological side. Um, now, in terms of going to Africa, the physical side is that you know we're going to be getting in and out of dugout canoes, we're getting on and off small planes. Um, the physical side was a massive challenge. Um, on the medical side, you know I had to work out whether I was going to be able to deal with the extreme temperatures or being in such remote environments, like how if something went wrong, you know, how would you get to, to some sort of medical support? And really the emotional side, not really knowing what, what that was going to throw up. Um, I was keen to embrace it, but um, you know, not really knowing like how, how I'd handle it. Um, a lot of people will probably ask why. Like, why would you go back to the place where you um where your life changed forever? Um, for me, there was kind of three key things. One is I wanted to get the wanted to get the tiger fish. Um, two, I wanted to physically see um, where I'd been. I got there late at night and really hadn't seen it. I got carried out on my back, so never actually saw all this place. Um, and then finally, I wanted to be able to go back to the hospital where I was told I'd never walk again and walk on my crutches um, back into the hospital. Um, 
so when I was going through this process, I was um, approached by a friend of mine who's a, who's a filmmaker and she'd sort of seen my journey from day one as a friend and um, decided she wanted to, to come along and film it. Um, and I, I guess like most people, you know, making a documentary about your life just seems totally absurd and no one's ever going to watch it. But um, I was convinced that by her that if, if we made this documentary, um, if it helped like one person with their journey or one person's family or a care or a friend, then um, it'd actually be worth it. Um, and if I gave like a really like a raw and honest account of my rehabilitation and my, and my journey, then um, we might be able to inspire a few people, we might be able to educate some people and make that journey just a little bit easier um, for the next person. So the simple mantra of the documentary and how I finished the night is you know what what is your tiger fish? Um, if I could leave you with one thing for anyone in this room or on the, on the webinar, that's how I would like you. What you, I want you to take away: keep asking in your life, uh, what is your tiger fish? Thank you. Thank you, James. I'm just going to turn that around. Um, so thank you. I'm sure I can speak on behalf of all of the audience tonight that that was a very, very inspiring talk. I think with or without neurological injury, that's given a lot of us a lot of food for thought. So thank you for sharing your journey with us. Um, for those of you at home, if you do have any questions for James, please pop them into the chat box um, and we'll have a look through them. And likewise, if anyone here has any questions for James, please um, do shout out. Um, in the meantime, if this Oh, sorry, just trying to get the chat box up. Um, this lecture was recorded, so thank you, James. It will be available on our Academy um, for other people to view. So please do share the word um, with your colleagues, with your friends, with your peers, um, and then um, it will be accessible, hopefully by the end of the week. So Happy thank eyes. you. <laughs> uh, one question that we have, can we view the documentary? Okay, good question. So believe it or not, it's still being, being made. So we've done pretty much half half of the um, sort of final edit. Um, but the idea is, I mean, COVID took a bit of a hit, took it, like pushed a few things back last year, but hopefully by the middle of the year, um, it'll be ready to enter in all the film festivals, kind of can and all those sorts of things. Um, and yes, yeah, so when it's finished, definitely we'll be able to, to view the documentary. We'll be putting it through um, all of the channels um, that we can, whether it gets picked up best case scenario as silly as it seems as I say like a Netflix or an Amazon Prime or something um, but we'll definitely push it out through the, the theatre network in Australia as a first and foremost when it's, when it's done hopefully next end of the year. A screening here too. Yeah, screening it up. <laughs> Brilliant yeah thank you any other questions from people here or at home? In Germany. Oh. <laughs> someone just asked where the, someone just asked where the power golfer was designed. So. Yeah, so a, a German lady in the audience <laughs> asked, asked where, the, where the power golfer was designed, which is which is Germany. From Otto Otto Bock for the people who are interested. Uh, okay, well, we'll just give it another few seconds if anyone at home has anything to ask. Um, but yeah, we'll certainly look forward to the documentary coming soon. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Any other questions in here? How fast is the music going on by five minutes? Oh, 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, someone has asked me how long it could take me as an able bodied person to swim 1.5k, which is, yeah, probably about 20 minutes in my prime. To give you an idea, I think the, the world record 1500 meters about. 14 minutes and 12 seconds. Wow. There are their bounds. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty quick. With keepers? Yeah. Well, they've all got big feet. Yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah. And webbed hands. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Well, thank you, everybody. And please do um, hop onto our academy and then you can get notifications for our upcoming evening lectures as well. Thank you.